All right, well, let's begin by reading the passage, Acts 28, verses 16 through 31. Acts 28, beginning in verse 16. Luke writes, When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect, it is known to us that it is, uh, it is spoken against everywhere. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some of them, uh, excuse me, some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their, their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. Well, may the Lord bless this uh, portion of his word to our understanding this morning. Now, last, um, last time we were looking at the conclusion of Paul's voyage to Rome, and I just want to remind us of some of the things that we've seen because i I know for myself, and I'm sure for all of us, we've probably forgotten those main points. But we saw, remember when they were on Malta, the extraordinary kindness of the natives, the Phoenicians, towards Paul and his companions, even though there were something like 276 of them. And it reminded us of something that the Lord calls us to do, because, you know, as this stood out to Luke, we realized that this is something that stands out to others as well. We need to show mercy and kindness to everyone as a witness to them. As we have received mercy, we are to show mercy. That's something that stays with people and opens them up to the gospel. We saw also how they misjudged Paul twice. At first they thought he was a murderer. Though the sea had failed to kill him, surely this snake wouldn't that it, remember, crawl out of the fire and fastened on his hand because justice must balance the scales. Uh, They were so used to seeing the connection that God makes between the crimes that people commit and the consequences of those crimes, they assumed that Paul must be guilty. And again, that reminds us that justice is simply another way. That is, God's pouring out His wrath day by day on the sins of mankind Uh, is simply another way that God reveals Himself through the creation. It's a part of what we call the moral argument for God's existence. He shows us that we've done wrong in our conscience, and then we see the consequences of that wrong. Uh, justice, you know, will basically balance the scales, and if, if, as uh, Immanuel Kant, I believe it was, taught, 
the scales aren't balanced in this world. They must be balanced in the world to come. And for that to take place, God must exist. When he didn't die, they changed their minds. And they thought, he must be a god. Now, again, they were wrong. They were wrong about Paul's ontological status. He was only a man. He wasn't a god. But they did recognize the connection between the miraculous event that had taken place and the fact that God was present. Again, that reminds us that miracle is the way that God authenticates his messengers. If we want to show somebody that the Bible is the word of God, we first of all need to point to the eyewitness accounts of those who saw Jesus do miracles to prove that he is a messenger from God and then to his testimony that the Bible is God's word. Now, we also saw Paul's ministry on the island, first in healing the governor's father, and then when everybody heard about the miraculous healing, how they brought their sick to him and how they were all healed, and how this opened the door to the gospel. Again, we see this miraculous authentication. And when God does that, he always does it for a purpose. It was, you know, that the message might be preached. And so we assume that Paul also brought the message on these occasions to glorify the Lord. And then finally, we saw God's answer to Paul's prayer. Paul was praying in, in the opening you know, chapter of the book of Romans that he might go to Rome and minister to the believers who were there uh, by ministering his gift and also being refreshed by their ministry to him. We saw the answer to that prayer. Paul arrived in Rome and Christians came from all over Italy, as it were, those who were close to Rome, in order to talk to Paul, in order to see him and to be, well, to minister to him and be ministered to by him. And that reminded us that if we want what God wants, and that is if we put his kingdom first and desire for his kingdom to advance, then we may ask for whatever we want and we can know that the Lord will give it to us. The psalmist writes, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Sadly, a lot of uh, professing Christians delight in the world and think they can ask God to give them the world, and God will give it to them. But that's not what He promises to do. He says, If we will delight in Him and desire the things that He wants, we can ask for those things, and we can know that He will give them to us. Now, having seen his ministry to the Christians at Rome this morning, let's close by considering Paul's testimony to the Jews. And we'll see here, of course, a few more things regarding evangelism. And that's what we've kind of been focusing on as we've been going through this book. We want to see how they did it and how maybe we can improve uh, our serve, so to speak, as uh, was it Chuck Swindoll who put it that way years ago, improving your serve. Uh, making a play on words with regard to tennis, but we are called to serve the Lord. How can we improve uh, the way that we evangelize others? Well, the first thing we see here is Paul's mercy towards his enemies, okay? Now, Luke tells us that after they entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself. We read in verse 30 that he lived in his own rented quarters, uh, which would allow him to receive visitors, as we're going to see in just a moment, and to minister the gospel not only to the visitors, but also to those who were guarding him. And we see from, uh, from not just this passage, but from the, the book of Philippians, where Paul is writing from this Roman imprisonment, that this visitation and this change of guards actually bore a great deal of fruit uh, through his ministry. He writes to the Philippians during his imprisonment in chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. I mean, these, this special group of guards that were guarding Caesar, uh, Paul, while he was in Rome, was not idle but he was sharing the gospel with the soldiers who were guarding him. And apparently they were part of the Praetorian Guard or at least became connected with them. And so 
basically they were, they were coming to know about Jesus Christ. And at the end of the letter, we find that as he's giving greetings, he even says some, that those from Caesar's household greet you. In other words, there were those who actually belonged to Caesar, perhaps even to his family, that were converted through the gospel because of Paul's ministry there. Now, Julius, the centurion who brought Paul to Rome, must have put in a good word for Paul when he handed him over to the jurisdiction of the officer in charge, giving to Paul this opportunity to share the gospel in these rented quarters. He wasn't put into a Roman prison waiting his appeal, but he was able to basically to live on his own. And I think this reminds us that if we do our very best to maintain a good testimony, whatever the circumstances, that the Lord will bless it. I mean, this is what the Lord calls us to do. You know, Paul was in prison, so what do you do? You know, do you, do you lament and grieve and basically complain because he's in prison? Or do you make the best of the situation and let the people around you know that, um, you know, whatever God ordains is right and you accept that and you use it? Uh, if you do that, it opens doors. And I think that's what the Lord would have us to do. Paul was exemplary throughout this entire imprisonment. And our Lord wants us to be exemplary in everything we do so that we might present him as we ought uh, to others. Now, three days later, we read that Paul called together the leaders of the Jews. He wanted to explain to them the circumstances that brought them there because they might get the wrong idea. He told them that though, that though he had done nothing you know, against his people, against you know, them or the, the Jews that were in Judea, or against their traditions, that he was imprisoned first by the Jews in Jerusalem and then by the Romans. And though after being examined, the governor and his council wanted to release him because they realized the charges were groundless, he was forced to appeal to Caesar because of the Jews' objection. You know, even though he had no intention of bringing charges against them, uh, because not to have done so would be to put his life at risk. Now, I want us to notice here that um, Paul is basically saying, I'm, I'm not here in Rome because I want to bring a charge against the Jews. I want, you, you know, the Jews, he's speaking to the Jews. I want you to understand that, that though these Jews hated him, that he did not respond in hatred. And that, that's, again, a lesson for us as well. The Jews hated him as they did the Lord Jesus Christ, as any unbeliever will hate a believer for doing what is right. But Paul was not seeking revenge. Again, as our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was not seeking revenge. He didn't call on his angels to destroy those who were crucifying him, but he prayed to his heavenly Father that he might forgive them. Now, this is what our Lord Jesus Christ means when he says that if somebody slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other to him also. And what Paul means when he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When it comes to the gospel, we need to be willing to endure whatever we must that the Lord might use us to gather together his sheep. Now, we shouldn't forget as well that you know, the Jews' position with Rome was rather precarious. We understand that they had won their freedom of religion, their freedom to exist and to worship their God, uh, which is, of course, truly is our God, uh, at a very high cost. The Jews would rather die than submit to the Roman gods and Roman worship, and the Romans understood that, and they allowed the Jews to have this freedom. So Paul wanted to make sure that he didn't rock the boat, he didn't want to bring Roman retribution down on the Jews by charging them with a crime against a Roman citizen. Again, he did this for the sake of the gospel. He did this for the love of his people. He did this in the hope that God might yet have mercy on them. So what I wanted to point out here is what Paul, first of all, tells the Jews that he gathers is, I have no gripe with, with, with our people. I want to make sure you understand that. The only reason I made this appeal was basically to save my life because the Jews were going to kill me. Okay, that's why I'm here. Okay, but secondly, we see Paul takes the opportunity to argue for the gospel. Now, explaining his appeal wasn't the only reason he called them together. 
he wanted to share with them the ultimate cause of his imprisonment, which he says is the hope of Israel. His belief that God had fulfilled his promise to send them his Messiah. Now, when they heard what Paul had said about his appeal, they said that no one from Judea had written to them about him. Nobody had come to them and reported anything bad about him. Now, maybe the Jews at Jerusalem, some commentators suggest, realized their charges wouldn't hold up even as they didn't before Felix and Festus and, and King Agrippa. Maybe they didn't want to draw any unfavorable attention to themselves, you know, with the Roman government, perhaps. Or maybe it was because travel was so difficult that they couldn't get there, you know, as it was for the Apostle Paul. But whatever the reason, these Jews knew nothing specifically about Paul's situation. They had heard nothing from these Jews in Judea who had persecuted him. They were, however, familiar with his message that everywhere it was being spoken against. And so they wanted Paul to explain it to them. We want to hear from you what this is all about. Now here is an evangelist's dream come true. Here is an audience asking to hear about the gospel. And again, we have to understand why they were willing to do this. I think, you know, not only because it was controversial, but because of Paul's demeanor. Paul had such an intense love for his people, even though they had basically turned into enemies. That had a lot to do with their willingness to listen to him. Remember what Peter again writes to the Jews in 1 Peter 3.15, which is, had, has been, if I can use this word, mantra, for why we do apologetics. You know, if you asked R.C. Sproul if he were still living today, why should we do apologetics? He would say, because of this passage. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Remember what Sinclair Ferguson said. Why did Peter write this? It's because he expected that as believers lived as Jesus Christ, that the Jews and others would, would very naturally ask, why do you live this way? Why do you believe these things? It's our love towards others, as well as our apologetics, that open them up to the gospel to make them interested enough to ask us to explain it to them. So really, I think what this shows us is that we need to, to pray for tangible ways to express this love towards other people. And, and again, let's not forget what we saw last time, which we've already reviewed, extraordinary kindness. Okay, how can we show kindness to others? Because that's what the Lord uses to make people open to the gospel. Okay, so they wanted to hear this. And having set a specific day, many came to Paul, and he explained the kingdom of God, Luke tells us, from morning until evening. Maybe he was explaining the idea that God never meant for the kingdom of God to be an earthly political kingdom, as remember the Jews expected, even Jesus' disciples expected, you know, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's not what he brought, but he brought a spiritual kingdom that would fill the entire earth, that would spread not by the sword, but rather through the gospel, and that eventually it would influence all the kingdoms of the world. He also tried to persuade them concerning Jesus, and I'm, I'm sure we can imagine what he talked to them about. Jesus is the promised Messiah. He proved this through his works, through his miracles. He sacrificed himself not, only for, or himself not only for the sins of the Jews, but also for those of the Gentiles. And he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, there to take his place as king over all creation, until God's plan for the world was fulfilled. And you can believe that he brought that home and told them, you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Luke tells us that he argued from the law of Moses, he argued from the prophets, the writings that they knew were God's word. Since his audience was already convinced of this, he didn't have to prove the Bible was the word of God, he didn't have to prove the Old Testament was the word, he simply appealed to them. But again, notice what he did. 
He argued from these truths. He tried to, to persuade them. Okay? Sometimes I think we get the idea that persuasion really has no part in our evangelism. You know, argumentation. That just sharing the gospel is enough. Just communicating that message. Uh, that God's sovereignty and the Spirit basically rule out any other considerations. Well, that isn't the case. Every time we see Paul evangelizing, we see him arguing, we see him reasoning, we see him here solemnly testifying. He knew that these were the means that the Lord uses to bring others to Christ. If we don't believe what we tell others that they should believe, if we can't prove that what we're arguing is actually the truth, not only will other people not listen to us, we will actually give them reasons not to believe. We need to know the Scriptures. I do believe that we need to be able to give a reason defense for the truth. Remember how Jesus said, if you do not believe my words, believe my works. He said that to the, to the Jews who believe the Word of God, right? We need to be able to give proof. And again, I think there's a very, very important um, distinction that needs to be made. don't have time really to develop this idea, but the fact is that uh, you know, we often think that Christianity or the Christian faith is something that simply has to be received by faith, that people are never going to believe it unless they just simply maybe take a leap of faith or decide to believe it. As Calvinistic Christians, we certainly believe God has to give us His Holy Spirit to trust Jesus in that way. But the Christian faith is actually a reasonable faith. That's what R.C. Sproul has been reminding us of in the apologetic series. It's something we can prove. It's something he says that is true beyond a shadow of a doubt. It doesn't require faith to believe that the Bible is true. That doesn't require faith in the same sense that we think of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. This is something we can demonstrate, okay? Something we can prove and something we should be able to prove. What the unbeliever can't do, apart from the grace of God, is actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, receive Him as Lord and Savior, and be saved. That requires a change of heart. So we have to distinguish these two things and realize that we can argue for the truth. We don't have to just simply say, well, you have to take it on faith. That's the only way you're ever going to believe these things to be true. We can prove this, we can demonstrate this, and we should be able to do that, and then demonstrating that the Bible is the Word of God, make the case for the gospel from the Bible, and ultimately, we still have to recognize that it's going to come down to God's mercy as to whether or not they actually ever receive Him. And we see that, thirdly, in this warning that Paul gives to those who reject Jesus. Okay, Luke next gives us the results. The same thing that happens whenever we share the gospel. Some were persuaded, but others weren't persuaded. God uses the gospel, as I've already said, to soften, to work through to save, but he also uses it to harden. But as Paul considered the people, the Jews, who didn't believe, knowing that that wasn't the final word, they might be rejecting now, but they may not reject forever, God may yet have mercy on them. Uh, he said to those who didn't believe as they were leaving, he gave them something to think about. He quoted that passage that the Lord said to Isaiah when he sent him to speak with his people because it also applied to them in verses 25 through 27. Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep on seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Now this is quoted when Jesus talks about the parables. This is quoted verbatim from the Septuagint, as I mentioned before. This is a word-for-word quote. I, I compared it in, you know, in the original language and saw, as a matter of fact, this came directly from the Septuagint, again, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Jesus used this passage to explain to his disciples during his earthly ministry 
why he was speaking to the Jews in parables, remember? He says in Matthew 13, verse 13, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. That's the reason why Jesus spoke to the Jews in parables. Now, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Because we often think that Jesus spoke in parables to illustrate the truth and to make it more understandable. At least that's the way I was taught it in many churches throughout the years. But the real reason was to hide the truth from them so that they wouldn't understand, so they wouldn't believe, because this was an act of judgment against the Jews. Now, interestingly enough, when John quotes this passage in his gospel as the reason why Jesus could do so many miracles, and yet the Jews still not believe in him, he actually gets the essence of what the Lord was saying to Isaiah, which means that the Jews did understand from the Septuagint what the Lord was actually saying. He says this in John 12, 39 through 40. For this reason, they could not believe. This, this is basically his commentary on, on what was going on with Jesus and the Jews. For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. See, what we're, what we're seeing here is what's in the Hebrew, okay, which is God is making this happen. It, when it's quoted in the Septuagint, it sounds different. It sounds like they're doing it. You know, it's man, their decision. It's because of, of their choices that their heart has become so dull that they can't see, they can't hear. But here John is saying, and Isaiah is saying, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts so that they would not see, they would not perceive, they would not be converted. This is God doing this. So basically what he's saying is no matter how much they heard, they would never understand. No matter how much they saw, they would never perceive. And the question is why? Well, you know, in the one case, it looks like God's doing it. On the other case, it looks like man's doing it. The Septuagint says, for the heart of this people has become dull. But in Hebrew, it says, render the hearts of this people insensitive. God's judgment on the one hand, man's sin on the other. So how do we reconcile these two things? Well, essentially, I think we do it in the same way that, that we have to do it in the case of Pharaoh. Remember? When God wanted to bring judgment upon Pharaoh, upon Egypt, in order to do this, Paul says he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Actually, the Old Testament says Moses, God says to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will not let the people go. But how did he harden Pharaoh's heart? Did he inject evil into Pharaoh's heart? Did he make, make it impossible for Pharaoh even though Pharaoh wanted to let the people go, God made it impossible for Pharaoh to let the people go by injecting evil into his heart. No, that's not what he did. What he did was he sent Moses to Pharaoh to say on his behalf, let my people go. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Okay? So yes, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but the way he did it was by exposing Pharaoh to something he knew would harden his heart apart from his grace, and that is the command to let his people go. Pharaoh was far too proud ever to allow that to happen. Now, what Paul was telling the Jews who didn't believe here was their unbelief was an act of God's judgment. But it was their own fault because this was their response to his truth. You know, you were, you were the ones making this choice, but God is the one, again, who is, is essentially leaving you in this hardness, this is his choice by not, by not giving you the grace that you need in order to turn because the only way that they could ever believe, the only way they would ever receive this truth was only if God would have mercy on them. Remember Romans chapter 9, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So this was an act of judgment and Paul wanted them to know you better think about this because this is God's judgment against you. And it's your own fault for your own hardness of heart. But then Paul, oddly enough, I mean, not oddly, but almost 
indirectly points to God's grace. Uh, he doesn't explain it to these Jews who were leaving, but, but the fact that he mentions it and then explains it somewhere else tells us that this actually was an act of God's grace. He gave them one more thing to think about. He says God was sending his gospel to the Gentiles, and they would listen. Now, that sounds like a slap in the face, doesn't it, to the Jews? Because you know what they thought about the Gentiles. They're going to receive the kingdom of heaven. You're going to be shut out. But what that plan of God was meant to do was to show mercy to the Jews. That's why he turns to the Gentiles. Remember that he was doing this to provoke them into receiving his son. Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 11, I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, their rejection of Christ, salvation has come to the Gentiles, which is what Paul just said. But why? to make them jealous, to make the Jews jealous so that when they see the Gentiles receiving the kingdom of heaven, they would also turn to Christ and receive that kingdom. So what Paul said, though it may have been a rebuke to the Jews, was actually meant to be a rebuke to them to get them to turn around. See, there was a reason why Paul said these things. It wasn't just to slap them down, but it was to get them to turn, to get them to think, to get them to repent. Now, again, all these things remind us that we're involved. You know, we need to argue, we need to persuade, we need to even rebuke and point out these passages of Scripture that are warnings to get people to think about it. But it reminds us at the same time that salvation ultimately comes from God. He must show mercy. He had to show mercy to us before we would ever believe. And He has to show mercy to anyone else before they will ever trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is from first to last in God's hands. Now, finally, we see some concluding remarks. Uh, Luke ends his narrative by telling us that Paul lived in Rome, welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Okay, um, he wasn't in some dark, dank prison for two years, but he was in his own rented quarters, and he was allowed visitors, and as we saw, he bore a great deal of fruit. But again, notice his attitude. He welcomed everyone who came, and he told them about Jesus. Okay? This is really what we should be aiming for in our lives, sharing Christ as openly as we can with as many people as we can, welcoming people and not, you know, rejecting them because they're sinners. You want to hold them at arm's length. And sometimes, you know, we're a little bit more like the Pharisees wanting to kind of keep to ourselves. But that's not what the disciples did. They were basically everywhere preaching the gospel, even when they're in prison. Now, he did this for two years. The book of Acts ends probably around 62 A.D. Um, it ends before 64 clearly, because that's when Nero set fire to Rome and blamed the Christians and instituted that basically empire-wide persecution. So commentators place Paul's imprisonment here from about 60 to 62 AD. At the date of this writing, Paul had not yet been tried before Caesar, but from what he says in his prison letters, he expected to, to be acquitted and to be released, and as a matter of fact, he was. And after he was released, Paul continued to minister the gospel. So Paul, basically one commentator writes this, and I'll just give this as a summary of what Paul did after his release. Okay. He says, quote, When released, Paul seems to have taken up his ministry again, going as far as Greece to Nicopolis, Thess uh, Thessalonica, to Crete, and to Asia Minor, to Ephesus, to Troas, and to Miletus. Possibly he went as far as Spain, as the first century writing First Clement may indicate. In about A.D. 67, Paul was imprisoned again by Nero and executed. So there were two you know, Roman imprisonments, and this was the close of the first one, but Paul 
after he had again gone uh, throughout the Roman Empire, he was later imprisoned and because of the persecution by Nero, who acquitted him the first time, he's executed. Now, Paul writes to Timothy in his second letter during this second imprisonment as he was soon expecting to die. And with this, we'll, we'll close our series. He says, for I am ready, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Why did Paul do the things that he did? Why, why do we see this, you know, this activity, this industriousness, this, this evangelism, this willingness to, to suffer? It's because he had his, his eyes set on that day when he would stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be given that reward. So, essentially, if we want this same kind of hope and, and hope to have this same kind of expectation, and comfort when our time comes to leave this world, we can only do it, we can only find it in the same way that Paul did. By trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's how anyone is saved, the only way we're saved, not just by believing the facts, anybody can do that, but by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, because we love Him, because we desire Him, because the Spirit of God has changed our hearts, and with the evidence that comes from that, putting God's kingdom first in our lives. That's what Paul did. I don't think any of us would argue against that. If we want that same kind of comfort, that's what we need to be pursuing as well. We may never reach the level that Paul did. I'm sure we won't. But we should be striving after that because that's what Jesus did. We need to follow Paul as he followed Christ. We need to follow Jesus in the example that he gives to us. Well, may God give us the grace to do that. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? Let's ask for His grace.